our LIU Learn On webinar um, on supporting learners with disabilities while online. Our team, if you've been on webinars before, you've seen these first couple of slides, but we wanna thank our team who have helped to get this web, uh, webinar series up and running and support for our site. Our Zoom meeting webinar norms are your chat and microphone have been disabled. Um, if you have any questions, please put them into the question and answer pod below. Um, and we have a team that will be responding to, to help answer any questions. Um, and you can also raise your hand if you'd like your microphone to be unmuted. Don't leave before the Act 48 credit link has been shared with you of the completion of the course so that you can get your Act 48 credit. For Act 48, you must be a PA educator. Um, you are welcome to attend our webinars no matter where you're from, but we, to get the Act 48, you must be a PA educator. Our webinars are also archived after the fact in our Learn On Recordings website. Um, so if you're not able to attend live, you can uh, attend later on. Our resource site is learnon.iu12.org. The expectations for online learning is that we're continuing with that ed education um, at the best possible. You need to know your school if you're doing um, continuity of education with just using um, enrichment and maintaining skills or if you're going to do um, new skills and new training for students. We also want to provide a free and appropriate public education for any student, making sure that our students with disabilities um, are being reached and provided services. We want to also understand that less is more. Prioritize those skills that you want to teach um, and narrow in on them a little bit more than you might spend time in the classroom. And you want to have time to kind of balance what you can offer. Our video, it's really important that students see your face for that social emotional piece they don't, so they don't feel isolated during this time. Um, most videos you want to be no more than about six minutes so that the students can maintain their attention. Be very clear on your objectives and expectations. Identify how much time you think it should take the students to complete the task. Organize and sequence your instructions so that they're very easy to follow. For today's webinar, our outcomes is we want you to be able to define the benefits and barriers of online learning for students and understand that we're going to specifically focus on students with disabilities today, but this is a very different environment for all students. And I know I struggle to learn online. It's difficult for me to maintain my attention if I'm in a long Zoom meeting. So I can't imagine some of the kiddos how they're faring right now with this system. And some have more support at home than others. So so we need to take that into consideration. We want to share some general resources with you relating to varying disability categories and reviews just some general resources related to students with disabilities in a broader sense. So what are the benefits of online learning? It gives us this great ability to present information in multiple ways. Um, we think of that Universal Design for Learning or UDL framework where we want to present information auditorily, through video and visual cues, um, maybe some physical movement. Well, when we're doing online learning, it's so much easier to blend those things because you might be able to assign a video and then get feedback from the students. And consider that feedback. It might be um, that you ask them just to turn on their camera and record a, a a question they answer verbally with you. You might have a Google Doc they have to fill in or something like that. Um, you may give a lot of freedom for kids that have great computer skills to design a video or something for you. So it, it opens up a lot of doors using an online com uh, community that we might not have had in our general classroom. We also can bear much easier, I think, to customize the pace and focus of our learning. If you think about when you send out instruction, I don't have to sit in a classroom and explain why one student sitting beside another student gets different levels of assignments because I'm pushing that assignment out privately to that student and no one knows and I don't have to really explain that, but they can do work on their level. And you can really see that individualized progress with students 
through this online environment. I think it really opens itself to being more individualized. Of course, then there are a lot of barriers also to online learning. Uh, access to technology itself. There are just going to be students that have a lot of access and students that don't, so how do we balance that? And schools are doing a great job of outreach and making things available to students, but we really need to work at that. And then we just don't want to make that assumption that all students know how to use technology. There is this idea that because this generation grew up with computers that they automatically know how to do things. Well, what I find with kids is they're really good at video games and using their thumbs on those little um, you know, controllers, but they may not be as intuitive in using a Google Doc or getting into our learning management systems, understanding passwords and security and things like that. So they may be things we have to directly teach before we can even get to the lessons. We need to consider accessibility for students who are deaf or hard of hearing, students who are blind, even the level of reading for students who are learning disabled or intellectually disabled. And one thing about a, a computer system is there's so many ways built in that we can get around those barriers that may not be typical in our classroom, but you have to know how to use that and you have to teach the students how to use it. So again, a barrier is our limited knowledge as educators in how to use those systems. I have learned a lot over the last three weeks about computer systems and this Zoom meetings and, and I'm very proud of myself for all that I have learned, but I've had a great team backing me up. If you're an educator who's out there on your own and you're just taught to create, um, I hope you have a support system and a network in place. If not, please know that our information is on that Learn On website. And um, also joining me today is Valerie Lill, who is our assistive technology person. And you don't always think of assistive technology for every student, but assistive tech and educational technology looks very different in this online world. And she can provide a huge amount of resources and help to you. So to be accessible, a device or a program should use uh, systems that cover all sensory capabilities. It should have a backup for vision impairment, hearing, a way for speech. So if I'm asking somebody to do a video for me and they their speech is not clear, I don't wanna have some speech activated device for them because it's not gonna work and it's going to cause problems. Also find motor control. Um, some kids can't use a keyboard. They don't have that fine motor control. So are there other systems in place that they could use a bigger mouse or a different shaped keyboard? And we really need to take that into consideration. Common issues with our learning management systems, that's like the program that your school has decided to use, is does it have a complicated login? If it does, you might have to go step by step, not only with students, but with families how to do that and have directions written out that they can post beside their computer. Um, my son's school, when he was in the classroom, he's a first grader and he used programs like Reading Eggs and IXL and they had that set up really cool through their school system that he had a little QR code that he just held up to the camera, got him right into his system. Well, at home I found out my computer is a little old and it didn't work the same way. Our camera didn't work to be able to do that. So we had to find a different login. And that was because of our own technology issues. But understand that those issues will come up that may not have been a problem in your school building. Also, is, it, is the navigation difficult to understand? If I want a student to get from one program to the next, or if where they have to look at information and then how they respond to it are on several different pages. I wanna make sure that navigation is as easy as possible and not have too many layers built in. So what are ways I can get around that? Um, and then just, is there tech support available? Um, I'm very lucky to live in a school district that our, the tech support at the district sent us an email very early and we've kind of put that to the side and kept it in a safe place that we know how to reach them if there's something technology wise Outside of the, how do I read this? It's something to do with technology. I can get support. So make sure you have something like that in place. I'm gonna let Val talk now about some of these resources for accessibility. 
Um, all of, hi, I'm Valerie Lill. I'm the Assistive Technology Trainer and Consultant with Lincoln Intermediate Unit. All of these resources for accessibility are available on LIU's Learn On Assistive Technology page. Within the Learn On um, page, this is on there. But there are three, I have multiple resources in each. First, for the online learning platform accessibility, as you can see, a lot of these are underlined in blue. These are all hyperlinks. So when you access the slide deck, if you, it is in the chat, so please use that or when it's posted later on our um, Learn On page. These are all hyperlinked to information. So online learning platform accessibility. I included a variety here. If you're using Zoom, if you're using Google for Education, I have G Suite Accessibility and just a general link on online education and webinar accessibility for you to access. Then I also included some information on accessibility. This will depend on technology, depending on what the students are using at home. So I have Microsoft Accessibility on there, a link on there. Um, Apple Accessibility, if they're using a Mac computer. Chrome accessibility, if your students are using Google Chrome accounts. And then there, the technology for access across platforms is, I'm just gonna click on that real quick. Oh, I'm not sharing my screen, I won't click on it. <laughs> Don't worry about it. The, this one, the technology for access across platforms. Yeah, that is a nice resource that has information on regard on Windows, iOS, Mac, Chrome, on a whole bunch of technology options that your students may need that was put together by some individuals who work in the assistive technology field in Pennsylvania. So I did want to include that in there. Then the last section is on just about something to think about digital instructional materials accessibility. Um, there's information on AIM, on providing accessible instructional materials, and also on designing an accessible online course. One thing I do wanna add about AIM, I don't know if any of you access Patton's AIM Center to get accessible instructional materials. However, I just found out yesterday they are going to be reopening in a limited fashion. So if you are looking for instructional materials to be sent to you or to be made, their AIM Center will be opening. I do not know an exact date, but they are reopening in a limited fashion soon. But that's just some guidelines of how to make your content accessible to all learners. Lori? Thanks, Val. Sure. So then what we're going to do is we've kind of broken it down resources by disability category. But of course, we want to give the caveat that not every student within a disability category is going to be the same and have the same needs. We are making some broad generalizations just to give you some vetted research-based options for the categories. But again, within that, you're going to have to navigate what's right for each student. I've heard this all the time with autism. If you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism because each student and an adult presents so differently. So just I want to share that, that I'm not saying this is the answer to everything, but just some resources for you. So ADHD, this falls under that category of other health impairments. But with ADHD and ADD, of course, we know that those students often have that inability to attend a task. Um, so what they might need is recorded content. And even I could see possibly adding in closed captioning for them. Because if I watch a video and we said about six minutes, I can go back if I missed something and couldn't pay attention. And think even if I had closed captioning, I could read it. So I'm attending the task visually, auditorily, but I could also read it, which might help. And I'm not saying you have to do that, but it could be an option. Because for some students, like myself, it's very difficult to attend to a video where I don't have that social accountability of other people in the classroom with me. They, of course, have that need for structure, so things broken down into smaller chunks. It's really good, I know, with my own child. It helps him to have a checklist. He can see his progress through the day and feel really good about, oh, I did these three assignments. I only have one more to do, and, and he can see that progress through the day. Also, we want to give them frequent chances for feedback. I know in this time right now of online learning, we've talked, there's a lot of talk about grades. 
I'm not saying feedback has to be grades, but just checking in with them. I'm really proud of you. I see how much work you've gotten done. Hey, it looks to me like you're struggling on this math work. Why don't we get together in a Zoom meeting and work on that? So giving them feedback helps them stay attentive to the task and, and to motivates them to want to work. So it gives, just working on giving them a sense of accomplishment and, and keeping them motivated. Some really great resources come from Attitude Magazine. If you don't subscribe to them, you can get a um, free, um, kind of they'll send you updates. I get them almost daily with articles and um, webinars and things like that that they have. Um, I know recently they had a podcast about um, teenagers and how to keep them you know, busy and attentive. Um, so there's just different things in here that they have webinar webinars on like math and um, you know things I, that uh, a parent wishes you as a teacher knew. So there are a lot of just you know open resources, and we have a little bit of extra time right now to read and find some of that stuff. So there's also really great parent resources. So if parents are struggling at home, you could share things out of that magazine with them. They have checklists. They have webinars for parents, and just that they don't feel like they're alone. I think it's a really great resource. Autism, when we get in the category of autism, we know that they have difficulty with change. So this, moving into this online uh, training has to have been very difficult. Reestablishing those routines uh, for kiddos had to be very difficult because they also tend to associate their environment with the task. So you're asking me to do schoolwork at home. This is home isn't school. And so that I'm sure took some time to work on. So what we have shared with a lot of our educators and parents is set up a school setting in your home that's not related to something else, maybe not at the dining room table or not um, in their bedroom or something, but a specific area where you can go to and have school time so that it doesn't, um, we can retrain their brain and make them think of what that that setting would be. Remember that they have uh, difficulty with social interaction. So think about that when you're setting up Zoom meetings or class time together. They may be better in a one-on-one -on -one with you. I'm not saying they shouldn't participate. If they're in typical gen ed classes, they absolutely should have access to that. But they may need follow up with you afterwards. They tend to be very literal thinkers. So if you put directions in writing and they are specific, that doesn't give them as much leeway to argue over the points of the, the, what you're asking them to do. And it makes them better understand your expectations. Some students can say, hey, here's a project. You run with it and come up with something. Students with autism tend to need more guidelines in that. I want you to have a written paper or I want you to have a presentation and here are some more specific guidelines that they might need that a typical um, student in a gen ed classroom might not need. But also online learning may really play to the strengths of an individual with autism. They don't have as much social interaction on an online environment. So they may do very well. And once that structure is set up, they may be motivated to get the work done because they know every day at such and such time, this is what I'm doing. So it really can play to the strengths of an individual with autism. A lot of great resources. I'm sure you've heard of Autism Speaks. They have resources for parents and educators, um, multiple toolkits in there. All the way, I know they have a great transition toolkit if you're working with older students. Um, then there's also supporting students with ASD at home um, that had supports in different the areas of communication, social, emotional learning, visual, and academics. There is an autism circuit that had principal uh, things that you could use for communication, behavior, and social tools. And then COVID-19, this live binder came out of Texas. And this is a combined intellectual disability autism live binder, but that's it's set up like a if you've never seen a live binder, it looks like um, a folder with tabs and each of those tabs has so much information. It was unbelievable. It's a really great resource. And a lot of what we're getting also came from resources out of um, Michigan, I believe it was, where we, they kind of had these resources together for us. 
When it comes to cognitive impairments, uh, online platforms may be difficult because of the level of reading that is needed. Um, and also, again, those things of how do you get into the program? Are there too many steps? So you may need to have instructions written out step by step, possibly even with picture cues to help them get through some of these systems. We also, with the reading and writing, may provide recorded or verbal directions. And also, this is a great place where AT can help because there are Chrome extensions if, that will help with um, minimizing the level of reading material and helping to summarize it. Um, and so if you have not watched Val's assistive technology um, webinars, they are recorded on our site and Chrome extensions is a great one to watch mm -hmm. and, um, and accessibility. I think she did one on accessibility, but AT there are uh, one on literacy. I think you did. Mm -hmm. um, I do have one on iPad apps also that I did yes. yesterday. So please pull up those webinars and look at them because they're very short and easy to watch, but she gives a lot of great ideas on how to limit the amount of reading that's required. Resources for cognitive disabilities. CEC has a Facebook page um, where it's teachers coming together to share ideas and problems and problem solve together. I think that's a great idea because they're people that are out there doing this right now. And so they are real live living it and going through the same problem as you are. Um, also that resource finder out of Texas and then distance learning for special education online is a website that's been developed um, that has a lot of great resources. And I'm sorry I'm not taking a lot of time to go into these. I just want to share. I get overwhelmed with resources. So I wanted to pinpoint two or three in each disability area that would help you kind of, okay, this is specific to that category. Emotional and behavioral disorders, it's really difficult to have control over social skills that are happening in the home. So this is an area where we may be really developing ideas to help parents and families. We want to really help students with self-regulation. So you might talk to a family and find out what's going on and what's a problem area. And, and you might have to work through those problems with the child and help them come up with things. They're going to have difficulty with this stress level that's going on right now. So having a predictable routine, teaching them some calming strategies really help. Um, this size of the problem worksheet you can open up. What this does is this helps them. Maybe this is something you do when they're not angry and say, okay, what are some things that make you angry and what size problem is that? And then what would be an appropriate reaction? And then afterwards, when they have a blow up, say, okay, let's look at what this problem was. Does that match with the reaction that you had? So I think that's just a great way to talk through anger and, and emotion with them. Um, some resources here. Um, there is a great site with responding to this COVID outbreak through PBIS. PBIS is the Positive Behavior Intervention Supports. Um, so it's a lot of pro-social skills where you're, you're setting the kid up for success and avoiding that negative behavior ahead of time. Common Sense Media has an a social emotional learning toolkit. EverFi is a free um, a site right now that has social emotional learning courses. So if you're a teacher that teaches uh, and needs some social emotional lessons, that's a great way to go. Boys Town has some great parenting resources, like little one pagers you can share with parents. And next comes L has a lot of really great self-regulation activities for elementary and middle school age students. Sensory related disabilities, deaf, hard of hearing, blind, visually impaired, and speech and language, of course, access is going to be difficult for them. So you might need Zoom recordings that have closed captioning. And that, again, that is easily done. I'm going to share here um, in resources. There's a checklist for teaching deaf students online that was, came out um, from uh, a national deaf I can't remember the start right now, I apologize, but you'll see that on there. And then here is how to use closed captioning with Zoom. It's not that difficult, so it's something that can be added in. Um, you can also use closed captioning with Screencastify. And then Texas has a sensory support network with a lot of resources. And I was going to add, yesterday, um, Ben Smith, he did a webinar on closed captioning in um, 
closed captioning and Google Slides and those and how to use that with Zoom. And he also did talked about closed captioning in YouTube. So those are available on the Learn On webpage. Great. So if you don't want to read about it and you want to watch a webinar instead, we have that recorded. Yeah, it was about a half hour long, but the first 15 minutes is where he covered that information. Okay. Um, blind and visually impaired, they have a lot of resources. There are a lot of foundations out there, American Foundation for the Blind, and American Council for the Blind. Both of those organizations have resources right now for the COVID and learning online. Um, there's also some virtual instruction on the orientation and mobility. Um, we have orientation and mobility specialists, and that's difficult to teach online. Normally, you have to be out in the community, but it gives some great games and things like that that students can play. Again, the Texas Sensory Support, and then CEC, again, has a Facebook page for teachers of visually impaired and deaf blindness. Speech and language, you want to talk about this, Val? Sure. My background, if you don't know me, is as a speech language pathologist. So the American Speech Language Hearing Association, ASHA, any speech pathologist would be familiar with this, has a hyperlink on there that is called COVID-19 updates. And they have a ton and ton of information and resources on doing virtual instruction with students with speech and language impairments. So if you're a speech pathologist, please check that out. And just another thing I wanted to add that if you are an ASHA member, which most speech pathologists are, they're offering, their continuing ed credits are expensive. They're offering for free on tons of topics through the end of June. So I am certainly going to be taking advantage of that. They have some setting specific resources for your school-based SLPs and audiologists. So again, scroll down within their COVID-19 updates to the school-based section and you'll find a bunch of great resources. Um, two other resources that I found online are um, the COVID-19 response plan for SLPs and the other next information is resources for SLPs and telepractice. Now what I'm gonna say is what the instruction that SLPs are providing during this time of virtual instruction is not traditional true telepractice or telemedicine. However, those resources could be very helpful at this time. Yeah, and they probably bring up a lot of the things about um, FERPA with making sure you're con protecting privacy, things yes, like that. Yes, that's a huge, yeah, ASHA has a lot of information on that. Okay. So specific learning disabilities, um, these students also often have inconsistent patterns of school performance. So using that assistive tech, those Chrome extensions and apps, again, I'm going to refer you back to those, can really help students because they can take like the screen, you know, when you go into YouTube and it has all those things that pop up that make you go down that rabbit hole of, oh, I want to watch that, I want that. They can blacken that out, which really helps. Again, using those things for the reading um, that can help read the text aloud or can help take a huge part of uh, information and, and narrow it down to more, more to the point for students so they have less reading, it really helps with that. Also, again, providing frequent check-ins and feedback and assigning a reasonable workload because some of these students really are independent at home and don't have parents helping them. So, we have to understand what they can independently handle on their own. And a lot of these students, we're going to really realize how much we supported them and didn't push them to be independent. So this might be a great experience for them for learning some independence. A lot of great resources for SLD. The first two are more like reading disabilities. There's a dyslexia live binder and then some fun and games with dyslexia. Um, and then teaching the learning disabilities, uh, COVID resources covers kind of all areas. And then the last two choices are both math instruction supports and how to work with students um, during this time on math. Some general resources right now, if you haven't heard, the Council for Exceptional Children, CEC, is providing a free 60-day um, membership for anybody, any educator and they provide a lot of great resources. Right now they have a webinar you can watch on teaching online. Um, there's concerns about, for special ed educators, resources for teaching remotely. Also, if you have not heard about Common Sense Media, I cannot, I, I just love their website, cannot promote it enough. They have resources for families during coronavirus and resources for educators. They have social emotional learning lessons on there that you can pull right out and use with your students. They also have a lot of great resources about using social media and being safe online, which right now is the 
perfect time to teach kids about that, all the way from kindergarten through 12th grade. So in kindergarten, it's just talking about who are my friends online and what's safe and talking about bullying a little bit. So you get up into high school, they're into some really deep issues like socially, how do I know what's real news and fake news and, and things like that. So great, great resource. Um, brand new information, I literally just got this in an email yesterday, so I have not had a chance to dig through this a lot. But there is a website that started educating all learners. It's comprised of more than 30 national educational organizations, including CEC. So I got the information through CEC. And it provides a hub of tools, strategies, tips, and best practices for supporting students with disabilities online. I think it's something that's being built. So I think as it goes on, more and more resources will be added. They even have a, a link there that you can add your own resources if you found something that's working really, really good for you. So I wanted to share that. I have, have not vetted it. I'll be honest about it because it is brand new, but I wanted to share it. So just remember, IEP is a legal binding document. It provides us guidance for FAPE, but understand that right now that is gonna look very different because that IEP is written for a classroom environment and we're now in a very different learning environment. But to the best of your ability, you need to be providing accommodations and modifications as they fit this learning environment. We are tasked with providing a good faith effort of educating our students. And parents are going to be more supportive if we are doing all that we can to reach out and help them. But if we are blowing things off like, oh, I don't, I don't need to close caption that for that student because he's not really deaf. He's just hard of hearing. Well, if, a, if you have been instructed to do that, please follow through and do it because there are already attorneys out there who are looking for opportunities to jump on this. And I don't want to scare anybody but document everything you are doing to prove that good faith effort. And if you need support and help, we are here to help you and back you up. Our contact information is listed there. Um, after this, we will continue the discussion in Zoom because we're running out of time here in our, our, webinar, our, <laughs> our webinar room. Um, don't forget that this is all on the Learn On website. And then if you could go to the web eval, um, and complete that so that we get information back. And then also don't forget to do your Act 48. Um, if you have any questions, we'll give you about two or three minutes to put any questions in the Q&A. Um, and if not, we'll move over to that Zoom room and we will, um, I'll go back to that so you can write down the number. And we will be in there for office hours also um, for the next hour or so. If you have any questions and want to follow us there, we'll be happy to talk to you. Thank you.